Tony for hosting us and thanks for uh, Nitro and Alexi as well for giving us the space. Um, so today I want to talk a bit about uh, image similarity, deep learning, coupled with some other machine learning applications uh, to provide a simple, very simple solution to a problem that some of our clients currently face. So let me start. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my background is not in computer vision. Uh, nor in machine learning. I'm a time series econometrician by training. A few years ago, I switched over to the machine learning world where I was building uh, engines in the intersection of the weather and electricity sectors. Um, today, I work at Datto. Uh, I'm a senior data scientist and my job is to help our clients uh, build successful, intelligent machine learning applications that satisfy their needs. So about us, uh, we are a machine learning startup uh, based off of Seattle, and we love building intelligent applications. Uh, we're about 50 engineers today, and designers, product managers, so on. Uh, and we are always hiring. So that happy, smiley, purple face could be any of you. So if anyone is interested, please come talk to me after uh, the talk. Uh, but very quickly, uh, I bet you've all seen that workflow many, many times. If you've gone to Strata Hadoop, they probably spoon fed you this. So I'm not gonna uh, go through it too deeply, but the data science workflow flow today uh, is uh, decomposed of many parts. Data ingest, uh, after data ingest, you have to take all that raw unstructured data, do something nice with it, transform it to something useful. You take that data features now, you build a machine learning model, you evaluate it, you deploy it as a service, so on. And that, that workflow is not linear at all. It's very iterative, uh, back and forth. Uh, so we at Datto have uh, offerings for every step of that workflow to help your work uh, a lot easier. So we have our S-Frames, uh, or GraphLab Create, and the S-Frame, which is an open uh, source subcomponent of GraphLab Create, which is an out-of-core computing data structure that allows you to scale up to the size of your hard drive on your computer. Uh, and do a lot of feature engineering, feature transformation, stuff like that. And then we have machine learning models from across the spectrum, whether it's image analytics, graph analytics, text analytics, to more standard machine learning models, trees, and so on. Uh, after you've built the model, the, the, we have uh, predictive services, which is a way uh, for data scientists to deploy their models as a service, uh, do A-B testing, uh, version their models, and so on. So we have an offering for every part of that component. Um, but moving on to the talk today. Um, so why do we care about image, image and machine learning? Uh, I guess that's a very hot topic nowadays. Um, the easiest example that comes to mind is Google image search. You put an image and you get images that are similar to the images that you queried. Uh, that may be easy for Google if they have a lot of semantics about the images, labels, stuff associated to the image. But when you ha don't have labels, and which is most of the image data in the world, that's a very harder problem to do. Uh, another uh, very common use that is starting to show up is visual recommenders. And that's an article two days ago on technology review, uh, basically saying shoes.com and uh, Pinterest are both using images as a way to recommend. So an example of this is you're searching for a dress or a shoe or whatever, and you can visually say what you like, but you don't know how to exactly describe it in word, uh, which is the usual way of doing or buying things. Uh, so you could say I want more like this shoe or more like this dress, and just drop a picture, and then you get recommendations for that picture. And then finally, one last application, uh, which is my favorite application, a client of ours, uh, Compology in the waste management industry, and they're literally working with garbage. So what they have is these cameras installed on big uh, dumpsters, and they classify the state of the uh, dumpster so that they optimize uh, garbage truck routes. So basically, truck routes are on trucks are only going to dumpsters when they know it's about time that they need to be serviced. Anyways, today's talk is about image labeling in particular, especially when you don't have any image data. So to start with that, all of these kind of uh, applications that I've talked about start with a very higher level question. is like, how do I compare similar images? Um, so 
when we talk about similar images, we usually take a, an image and we somehow represent it as a numeric vector, right? And then that vector could be simple pixels. So a pixel is a RGB float from 0 to 255, for example, or it could be a more complex transformation of those pixels, right? So you take those two images, you pick a distance function, and then you can measure some similarity across two images. There's no science here. So the problem is uh, raw pixels tend to perform very badly. Uh, I didn't try to compare similarity of those two images, but it could be quite misleading. Uh, so uh, feature engineering in images is actually a hard thing to do. Um, it requires a lot of uh, domain-specific knowledge and domain knowledge of domain-specific software. So one example in, in the Python world is scikit-learn is used for almost everything, right? People love scikit-learn, I love scikit-learn. But then when it comes to images, you have to switch over to scikit-image. And that's a, a bit underdeveloped. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues. You go to OpenCV or something like that, then it requires a lot more knowledge, way less intuitive to work with, and so on. Um, so that's really hard. And this is where uh, deep learning, with the advances of computer vision, have brought to the table some new advances that are very promising, to, that lend themselves to that type of problem. OK, so before moving on, I need to uh, just say, this is not a talk about deep learning. I'm just going to briefly cover a few important things that I'm going to use, and then go on to building the application that I'm talking about. OK? So what do we mean when we say learning deep features? Uh, let's start with the most simple classification problem, right? You have two classes represented by those two deterministic lines. Uh, and then you have input to the data, and you want to uh, classify the probability uh, the class given that input data, right? Very simple problem. If you use any form of a logistic or linear model and so on, you're going to try to fit a line between those two curves, right? A line between those two curves is impossible. You're not going to be able to fit it. So what you end up with is a discriminant, something like this. Anything in the blue area is blue. Anything in the red area is red. But obviously, there's a lot of errors, right? So from this point, what could you do? You could sit down on this problem, create smarter features, interactions of features, qu quadratic features, and so on, to try to solve this problem. Or you can add one more layer of complexity to the problem, right? So everyone's familiar with this diagram. It's a neural network. So what the neural network is really doing, taking that input space, doing some transformation to the input space, so it represents it in a nonlinear manifold that then you can linearly discriminate against. So what happens is you end up with something like this, right? So if you look at that image, those curves now have been pushed to the sides, right? And this is what the hidden layer actually does. So the hidden layer really does most of the work. It pushes those two classes apart from each other, such that any activation layer you have at the end layer can perfectly discriminate between them. Right? So now this begs the question. In many cases, I could basically chop off the end layer and use the features that are created in the middle layer, because those are very useful. And I could put whatever classifier or regression model I want on the end layer and still have something that is pretty useful <coughs> with very easy fluency. So deeper networks or deep learning is just many stacks of these hidden layers, where each hidden layer is a complex transformation of the layer that it, 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 it precedes. Right? Uh, now, convolutional networks, which are commonly used in image problems, are a bit more specific than this. The layers themselves are a bit more engineered and have more specific properties. But I'm not going to go into this right now. If you have questions, I'll be happy to cover this in the end. So deep learning is great, right? We can learn all these complex features rather than sitting and wasting time. Uh, and it also has shown recently some really good impressive gains. Everyone knows this, so I'm not like saying anything really uh, special. special. Uh, the problem is it's really expensive to, to train. Expensive to train in the sense that when Google out open sources TensorFlow. They don't have a problem with that because you know there's a lot of deep learning software out there. But Google has the most rich data in the world, and this is where Google like has its gains or advantage in any way, right? So but, like it requires really a lot of data to train and very computationally expensive to train, right? Also, it's very hard to tune. If anyone's actually tried to build a convolutional network here. Without looking at some research, they probably know that it's actually hard to get something successful like AlexNet or GoogleNet or something like that. 
Okay? So here's the solution. Transfer learning. That's pretty nice. You have lots of data. You, you, you have some graduate students in the lab somewhere sitting, uh, living off of $1,000 a year. You know, that's what graduate students do. And uh, they, uh, they learn, they spend a lot of time building a very good network that does very well at some problem. And then people like me come in, they take that architecture, they have data that is unrelated to the data that was used in the original training, but what they could do is chop that network off at some point and extract those features that were learned from the pre-trained model. And this is, has shown some really good generalization properties in many different applications, and I'll walk through this in a bit. Okay? So, just one more thing before I stop for a second and switch to the demo. Um, so let's say we found similar images to one image. So I have an image, a query, and I've uh, searched for its most similar images. So I have, in this case, a toilet, and I have a data set of images. If I use the deep features that we were just talked about, I'm gonna end up with first similar image, second most similar image, and so on, right? If I go ahead and do this for every image in my data set, then I will end up with something like a similarity graph, right? And there's a lot of complex things I can learn from this graph. And then we'll talk about this in a second. What this graph says, a node is a picture, and an edge between every two nodes means that those two pictures are similar to each other. Now a clutter of, edge of nodes indicates that a density of images that look quite similar, right? And I could use this to my advantage one way or another. So before I continue, I'm gonna switch off to show some demo and then we'll pick it up from there. Okay, so I'm gonna start off by importing GraphLab and network X for plotting, matplotlib, you know, the usual plotting libraries. Um, I'm gonna upload my data, uh, which is in an S-frame. S-frame is our data structure that is very highly compressed. And what the S-frame currently has is an image ID, an image, and then some features, but for now ignore, ignore those features, we'll get back to them in a second. If I look at the images of my data structure, this is what I'm gonna have. So they're images of real estate, okay? And that's a problem one of our clients has. They have an inflow of about 40,000 images a day that they need to cluster, classify, label somehow, and they get them from very different sources where the labels are bound to be wrong. So they had an idea of using the places data set, which is a known data set for images. Problem is they can't license it in a commercial way. So we were work trying to find a solution uh, so that they can label their images without that data set. Um, so anyways, moving on. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is use something called our deep feature extractor. So what we do is, in our software, in, GL, in GraphLab Create, we have a pre-trained AlexNet uh, model based off of the AlexNet architecture. And what you could use it as a transformer. So you pass in any image you want, and you could extract the features that are the, feature, the, the output of the layer before the last layer uh, prior to classification in that model. So I'm not gonna run this now on the CPU, I just like cached it from earlier. But basically those features in my S-frame earlier are basically those D features. There's about 4,096 of them in every image, uh, and they are very sparse. So as you can see here, only a few of them are activated, the rest are pretty much zero. So about 5% of, of features of every image are activated, okay? Now to give more kind of intuitive insight to what those images are, I'm gonna look at those two images which are quite different. And then I'm gonna take their features and compute their absolute difference from each other. So those two images are not similar at all. So if I just take those features, I would hope that the features, 0 to 4096, are quite different and that appears to be the case. If I move on to two images that are similar, two bathroom images, and I compute their differences, then you would hope that the differences now are much smaller. Right, so the features are obvious, the representation this is much closer between similar images than none. Again, nothing magical here, it's intuition that we expected and it's working. So I'm gonna go ahead and build a nearest neighbor model to build my similarity graph, okay? So we have many toolkits, including nearest neighbor's toolkit. I'm gonna just create a nearest neighbor's model, pass in images, the, the S-frame, and uh, use a distance cosine function. 
And the reason why I'm using a cosine function as opposed to Euclidean is because of the sparsity of the input space. Um, so I'm going to create the nearest neighbors model. And if I query image ID 71, which is this image, I could see that the first four images are quite similar to it in the sense that they're all bathrooms. And they all have a similar type of design to the bathroom. So we're starting to get somewhere in the sense there's some similarity across those images that is tangible. Okay? So I'm going to go to do that and just extract the entire graph from uh, that nearest neighbor model. So basically, it's just a for loop that's going through every single image in your data set, computing its most similar neighbors. And if I do that and I plot it very quickly, I'm not going to plot this right now because it's going to take them some time. I'm going to end up with this. Now, what this is is I'm looking at a representation of my, my entire image data set, right? And I can see some natural clusters arising in my data set. So I have a cluster here, I have a cluster there, and so on. I still have no idea what those clusters represent, and that's the next step. But at least there's something, right? Now, just intuitively, what's, what the visualization library is doing, it's a form of clustering. It's a, not, it's a form of a not very scalable form of clustering. It's MDS scaling, and then basically projected on two coordinates, and you get uh, that plot. That is not very scalable. So instead of using that, the coordinates here, what I'm just going to do is do k-means on the data set and use that as clusters. I'm still going to use my similar, similarity graph for something else in a second. Okay? So I'm just going to build the k-means model. And then if I look at my k-means, you can see the cluster IDs, the average, the, the centroids of each cluster, and so on. Nothing really fancy here. So going back to the to this talk. So now I, I, have, I have that similarity graph, right? And I have these clusters that I really don't know what they are, what they represent, right? So is there any way I could take that cluster and find the most representative images of that cluster in order to describe what that cluster represents, right? So I take a cue from PageRank. Um, so everyone knows what PageRank is, right? Uh, it's an algorithm used by Google search rank websites. And the page rank is uh, a measure of how important that website is. Intuitively, for those that are not aware with page rank, it's if you were to randomly serve the web, it's the relative time you allocate randomly uh, for on each website uh, overall. So I'm going to do the same thing on my similarity graph. So I have a similarity graph in which the edges represents how similar s pictures are from each other. So intuitively, the the image of each cluster that has the highest page rank is the most representative image of that cluster. So if I can take each cluster and look at the top 10 page rank images of that cluster, if they're all of the same type, then I could, with some confidence, basically propagate, propagate that label onto the entire cluster. Okay, So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to write a, a function here. What it does is it basically takes the similarity graph that I have. It's going to take the cluster IDs. It's going to create a subgraph based on all IDs that belong to, to the same cluster. Now in the subgraph, I'm going to do page rank and display the top 10 most representative images. Right. So if I look at cluster I ID 0 and I run page rank, It's going to take time. So uh, the S-frame is a, is a, has lazy evaluation. So basically, I've been running a lot of operations that haven't materialized. So OK, anyways, right, I ran page rank on the first cluster. And I ended up with all these uh, empty rooms, right? They're all very similar. They're all very empty, <laughs> kind of ugly, nothing special there. If I go to the second cluster and I do the same, these are images of plans. You know, a lot of times you go on Craigslist, you see a floor plan, you go on, you're buying a house, there's a floor plan in that data set, right? So it seems to be pr pr working pretty well. I'm going to go on to the third cluster. And it is front yards of your typical American house, right? So it seems to be pretty consistent. Now, obviously, this is machine learning. Things don't work always very nice. So if we dig deeper in some of these, 
you will find errors. Uh, so this, these are a, a different uh, a style of bathroom. And if I look over these pictures, I have a picture here that looks like a very ugly kitchen. Otherwise, uh, a bathroom, <laughs> you know? So obviously that's a misclassification, but that's fine, you know, that's machine learning. That's, uh, that's the nature of things. And I'm gonna keep on going and going. If I keep on going, I'm not gonna run them all, but you have kitchens over here, you have nature and scenery, you have living rooms and dining rooms, you have more different style of toilets, and then you have like this very like sharp front view of houses. So now that I've represented all my clusters, with, I have an idea what the cluster is, I'm gonna just forcefully assign the label of the 10 uh, most representative images onto the entire cluster. Now that's not the smartest thing to do. I know we could do label propagation, which probably will work better, but I just didn't have time to do it. <laughs> as simple as that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, just do that, assign labels, and replot my map, and this is what my map looks like. So there's some cases where rooms are very separated, so like the plans are very separated from the bathrooms, that are very separated from the kitchens, except for some ugly kitchens in here. Uh, but as you could tell, uh, so for example, in here there's a, a bit less separation, but that's fine because, you know, there's reasons. Uh, so I met this one. So this is like the two styles of empty rooms. You have some errors uh, that we can work on fixing. Okay, but this is where the demo ends in here. So what's the next step? As I said, this is a very simple model that I built and I've assigned these uh, labels in a very uh, naive way. You could do other things. You could do label propagation on the subgraph or you could build a classification model on the, the, the labels that you've assigned with some confidence and you could measure confidence from page rank or something like that. And then, uh, Repeat, diagnose, find the errors, try to fix the errors. And finally, once you have something good, you could deploy that model as a service in which people are querying with different images to kind of get labels from that image. Uh, so that's the end of my talk today. Yeah? How do you get the number of clusters for the KVs? Yeah, that's a very good question. Okay, so I did this very heuristically when I did MDS scaling over here. I just, where, where was that image, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so no, no, it's from here. I just, the scaling suggested that there's about 10 representative clusters. Not the most scientific way, I agree, but just for fun, it seemed to work fine. Uh, obviously, there's uh, two types of bathrooms that if I were to decrease the number of clusters, they would merge, and if you look at the, the bottom graph in here, uh, the last graph, you can see that there's a lot of similar rooms that you could merge, so let me go to the bottom. So those two, over here, those are two styles of empty rooms. So if I were to decrease the number of clusters, they would have been merged together. Uh, but that's fine, you know? Um, so non-scientific in any way, more visual than scientific. Yeah. What's the embedding here? So the, 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 this, is, uh, this is using the, X, the XY coordinates generated from the MDS scaling and just do color coding on it. So it's the same embedding as the one before. I, I mean, yeah, if, if I displayed an embedding based off of k-means, then you would get perfectly separable, uh, obviously. So it's not the nicest way to do it. Yeah? How can you figure out the errors? Like, you know, the bathroom is like down. It's part of the same cluster, so I thought you were... Can you please repeat the question? The Sorry. Can you repeat the question? So how did you figure out the errors of the bathroom coming out into the... the um, I, uh, I mean, this is like where iterate. So I played around enough with the data set that I know the types of bathrooms that get classified as kitchens, literally. It's like, so a lot of bathrooms have this like wooden color cabinets with white tile and whatever, and a lot of ugly kitchens have the same style. So did the yeah. detect Yeah, so no, the clustering mixed it up, right? So I could do more sophisticated clustering. So this, similar, this is a graph of 2,000 images. If I did geodesic based clustering, I would b almost certainly get a better result than k-means. The problem is geodesic clustering does not scale more than 30, 40,000 images. And that's a, like for that specific client, they had like 40,000 images a day. So that is not a good solution. Uh, anyways, uh, so if you want to learn more about Datto, uh, please visit our website. Uh, you could download us and try us for 30 days 
for free. If it's personal use, you have a longer trial as well. So everything I did today, except for visualizing that, class, that first plot, the network plot, is in Graph Lab Create. So you have graph analytics, image analytics, clustering, lower level toolkits, and whatnot. We scale as much as your hard drive uh, fits data in it. So we're out of core. Uh, and if you want to learn more, we have a lot of events, a blog, and a lot of uh, notebooks to start and learn from. And finally, again, we are hiring. This is like my beg to hire. Please apply. <laughs> yeah? So how would your algorithm, everything that you present is very how Thanks. would you perform if the image is rotated? OK, or so, so, or so there's two things. Uh, one, the reason why I didn't use the AlexNet model right away to label or classify these images is AlexNet was trained on a very general data set. So its classifications tend to be very bad when you look at a domain-specific set of images. Okay? So once you have a domain set of, set of images, you have to do something different. Either train, if you have a corpus, then the best thing to do is train your own convolutional network on that corpus. Right? The second part uh, is uh, AlexNet itself, or most deep, if you train a, a convolutional network smartly, basically you need to make sure that you take into account things that are related to uh, variational and translational changes of the images. So in the training set, what you end up doing is flipping a lot of the images. You rotate some images. You differ the gradient of the colors on the images. But that's part of all the data preparation part that goes into training the model. Since we're using a pre-trained model, they've taken into account all of that, and we just extracted the features that are invariant to scaling and translational movements of your image. Okay? And the second question Oh yeah, so, so for the AlexNet architecture, we can score on a GPU about 200 images a second. Uh, on a CPU, it's three images a second, uh, so that's why I didn't run it here. Uh, our deep learning library uh, is built on top of CXNet. For those of you that are uh, knowledgeable of the convolutional network type of thing, uh, which is one of the faster libraries out there. And soon we're moving on to MXNet, which is a dis um, distributed, more scalable version of it. Yeah. yeah. So you actually, uh, by doing this analysis, you extracted some labels over the, over the data set that mm -hmm. more or less you could do. Do you think you could get some kind of benefit by fine tuning the, the map? I mean, so here's a, so the, the, the question is benefits versus time spent of fine tuning things, right? So. The Alex, I mean, if you have good label data set, I'm pretty sure you can fine tune the network itself, right? But you're, we're talking about over like 200, 300,000 like very well labeled images. So yeah, I, I mean, if you have 500,000 like really well labeled images, don't even fine tune because, I mean, there's a lot of new papers that show fine tuning is not all of that. And you could start with 500 images from scratch and train your own network very well. And so, there's a, the, the places data set is licensed by MIT, and it's a 1.3 million real estate images. And it does way better than AlexNet with fine tuning. Right? So, but, and they build the architecture from ground. So I would say if you have that wealth of data, I train your own network for sure. Yeah? We, so our uh, deep learning library, you could build any architecture you want. But in the sense of like pre-trained models that you can extract features from, currently we only have the AlexNet architecture. Uh, you could build the GoogleNet architecture, but you need data, you need blah, blah, blah. It takes time and effort. Um, on, as opposed to this, where I extracted the features from the AlexNet in about 10 minutes. So there's... Uh, so, yeah, so the uh, mo Cafe Model Zoo has about Last I checked, like about 15 pre-trained models, including Google Net. Um, the problem with Cafe is uh, the models are not very interoperable to other platforms, right? And in terms of popularity, I would say now with TensorFlow coming up and with MXNet like improving a lot, I would say Cafe is not top three most used deep learning frameworks out there. So there's cost of using Cafe. I think my the, my best part of Cafe is the fact that models do exist, which other platforms do not support. Yeah? How does TSNE fit into the picture? Yeah, TSNE does not scale. 
uh, as simple as that. I mean, if you want to use TSNE, you need to start by doing PCA. If you have 4,000, like this, these images, let's say they have on average 80 by 80 pixels or whatever, you need to do PCA reduced dimension or whatever, reduce the dimension down to less than 100. And then on top of that, you can do TSNE with more than 20, 30,000 images. I mean, in this live demo, I could have done TSNE. Actually, this is what I wanted to do, but it's not a scalable solution in any way. Yeah. I actually think that DSNE is scalable, like the original DSNE is not scalable, okay. but the, the author of the DSNE paper uh, presented a, a way to train the RBM mm -hmm. with the uh, DSNE loss function, uh -huh. and that one is scalable. Not uh, only that, but it actually is not just used for dimensionality reduction, it can be used for prediction. So just like you can sort of reduce a new example with PCA, you can reduce a new example awesome. with that version. Thanks for the tip. Okay, so I haven't around read around the new picture. picture. Yeah, I haven't seen the new picture. I played around with the old, the the, the first version of TSNE, right. and you're limit. You're very yeah, concerned. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks. Thanks, Alexi. Thank you. <laughs>